Welcome everyone to the 15th meeting in 2016 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Everyone present is pleased reminded to switch off their mobile phones. No apologies have been received for this meeting. Agenda item one, the committee has asked to decide whether they are happy to take agenda item four in private and whether consideration of its draft budget report should be taken in private at future meetings. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Agenda item two is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2017 and 18. I welcome Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, and Mike Baxter, Director of Finance at Transport Scotland, Colin Cook, Director of Digital, Joe O'Hara, Head of Forestry Commission Scotland, and Simon Hodge, the Chief Executive Forest Enterprise Scotland all from the Scottish Government. I would like to invite Mr Ewing to make an opening statement, but, but if I may, Cabinet Secretary, just say to you there are an incredibly large amount of questions to get through this morning, and, and I would be very grateful if we could all make a, an attempt to get through the questions, all of the questions, by giving short answers. I don't want to distract you from your opening statement, though, Mr Ewing, so if you'd like to make one, please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, convener, and good morning to uh, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you this morning, and I welcome the chance to give evidence of how, in particular, my portfolio spending helps meet the Scottish Government's uh, manifesto commitments and how it will assist in delivering our climate change plan, which I believe may be the focus of the committee budget scrutiny. Um, our overarching aim is to grow the rural economy and support wider connectivity. We will do this by delivering a reform to common agricultural policy, building up our world-class food, drink and forestry sectors, building growth within our marine and coastal communities, improving digital connectivity, particularly to remote and rural island areas, uh, improving physical connectivity and economic productivity. Uh, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Portfolio Budget has increased from 2.6 billion in 16-17 to 2.8 billion in 2017-18. I'd like, if I may, to focus on three aspects of it in turn. First of all, the rural economy. We will continue to deliver the reformed common agricultural policy to obtain the best results for Scotland's rural economy, environment and communities. We will also continue to support fisheries, aquaculture and fish processing sectors by maximising the benefits of the new European Maritime and Fisheries Fund to create and safeguard jobs in remote rural areas and to develop and sustain markets for premium Scottish seafood products. I have listened carefully to forest industry leaders and I believe the framework we are establishing with this budget will help drive the growth in the future sector that we all wish to see. Firstly, this budget supports the vision of seeking a step change in the area being planted by increasing the funding for forestry grants to £40 million. This is part of achieving our programme for government commitment to look at ways in which we can meet the planting target of 10,000 hectares per annum. Second, we will continue to support the strategic timber transport scheme by facilitating the sustainable transport of timber in rural areas of Scotland and delivering benefits for local communities and the environment. Thirdly, the budget will help address unused and derelict land using trees. There will be an important role here for Forest Enterprise Scotland's work on the National Forest Estate. On digital connectivity, this year's budget is the first of a multi-year investment in broadband towards the delivery of our commitment in the programme for government to extend superfast broadband access to 100% of premises across Scotland by 2021. The budget we have allocated will fund the final phase of the £400 million Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband programme that is on track to deliver fibre broadband access for at least 95% of premises by the end of 2017. And the budget will support the initial phase of reaching 100% programme. We will launch new procurement activity next year to deliver new public and private investment focused on bringing superfast broadband to the hardest to reach premises, those that won't benefit from the Digital Scotland programme. 
Transport infrastructure is a key area where improving connectivity between our cities, rural communities and the centres of economic activity is vital to boosting productivity and competitiveness. What better example convener than the construction of the £1.35 billion fourth replacement crossing project scheduled to open to traffic in May 2017. We will also continue our significant investment in Scotland's railways to support a safe, reliable and high-performing railway. Electrification between Glasgow Queen Street and Edinburgh Waverley will be, for example, completed with new electric services due to start from July 2017. Significant investment will continue to be made in the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements and the Aberdeen Western peripheral projects which are scheduled to open to traffic during spring 2017 and winter 2017-18 respectively. Our contribution through support for air and ferry services, including two new major vessels being built on the Clyde for routes serving Arran and the Western Isles, will help support plans for more autonomy for our island communities. As part of our efforts to meet our climate change targets, we will continue to support efforts to reduce the carbon emissions from the transport sector. We will agree the actions to be set out in the climate change plan to reduce carbon emissions from transport. Our approach will be to reduce the need to travel, promote mode shift to more sustainable transport options, increase transport network efficiencies, focus on supporting the development and uptake of new technologies such as an expensive elect extensive sorry, electric vehicles charging network, successful green bus funds, and hybrid ferries. This represents investment of over £230 million since the Future Transport Fund was launched in 2012 on top of public transport funding. In conclusion, convener, the 2017-18 budget is once again a robust plan to develop a more inclusive economy that works for rural communities and for businesses. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The first question is from Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Welcome, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you mentioned in your uh, opening statement about the increase uh, to your portfolio from the budget, and we welcome that. I'd like to kick off, though, with forestry, if I may. Um, we were told um, on the 23rd of November by Stuart Goodall from Comfort that in order for us to now um, reach our planting targets, we would have to go up to 13,000 hectares a year, up from the 10,000. Do you think that there has been enough money in the budget allocated to that? And in the um, budget line, uh, there is an increase in cash terms of 0 0.2 million, but actually a real terms decline of 0 0.7 million. Um, can the Forestry Commission continue to deliver all of its requirements? Is this manageable? And if there are any efficiencies to be made, how do you think that they are going to find these? Um, well, th th thank you very much. And, and this really is an extremely important matter for us all concerned with the, with the <coughs> rural economy. The, the forestry sector as, as a whole is, uh, is one that, uh, that, that uh, sustains, I believe, 25,000 jobs. Uh, and the gross value added is around £1,000 million. And I think it's important to pick that, take that big picture because you know, perhaps there has been a sense, convener, that, that in the past forestry has been seen as a sort of uh, Cinderella-type uh, type industry. It's not perhaps received quite the same focus as farming and fishing. I think that would be a fair point. And yet, those of us, and I suspect most of us, have um, visited, for example, sawmills in our own constituency. I certainly have with Gordons and BSW in my own constituency. In fact, I live uh, less than a thousand metres from a uh, boat of garden plant. That they are now industries which are highly innovative and, and, and use uh, innovative technology. So they're as modern as any other industry. Uh, and it is absolutely clear that they tell us, as Stuart Goodall mentioned, um, that in order to meet their requirements, not in the next five years, but the next 10 and 15 and 20 years for supply of timber, there does need to be a step change in the increase in, plant, in plantations of productive species in particular. And that means meeting our targets, which presently we are not doing. I'm determined that we should do that. Uh, and there are a number of means by which we need to do that. Not all are financial, but some are financial. 
And that's why I've set out in my opening statement the commitment that we've made to, uh, to providing very substantial funding uh, to assist in plantings. Other parts of what we're doing, convener, is to assist further the Timber Transport Fund because in my, in my part of the world, in Gail Ross's part of the world, convener, part of the problem is that assets are stranded. They're inaccessible because of the remote location of forests uh, and because of transport problems. It is very difficult to harvest mature forests in some cases. So the Timber Transport Fund is, is being maintained. Uh, and thirdly, as well as the funding for planting and the Timber Transport Fund being maintained, uh, of course, we are looking at improving the procedures by streamlining the procedures. And Jim McKinnon, uh, formerly the Chief Planner of Scotland, has recently produced a report which has been made public, convener, and I think, can, I believe, conveyed to this committee, um, which sets out how we can streamline the processes to make sure that they are swifter and easier to navigate. Uh, and I praise the work of Forestry Commission, Forest Enterprise in doing that. But perhaps for a, for a specific answer on some of the budgetary aspects that I've given an overview, I hope that's useful. It's an extremely important issue. So please, please uh, bear with me for taking a little time to set it, set it out. It's something I feel really passionate about, convener. But perhaps to answer some of the specific budgetary matters, Joe O'Hara uh, of the Forestry Commission could help out. Well, before we ask Joe to come in, I'd, I'd quite like to drill down on those figures a wee bit, and, and Peter has some questions that might help us do that, and it might then bring Joe in sufficiently. Yeah, I mean, uh, welcome to everybody, and I, I, I need to declare uh, my interest in, in, in the register as a farmer before we, 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 we get my fingers wrapped again, so I've already done that. Uh, I'd just like to drill down, as, as a convener says, we have been told that we're well behind the, the planting targets, and, and, and when we, we've heard that if we are to meet the 10,000 10, hectares a year uh, target, we need an extra £15 million pounds in the budget, and if we're going to achieve and catch up the, the backlog, we need to be planting 13,000 hectares a year, we need about an extra £29 million pounds in, the, in the budget, and this is to obviously support the private sector in, in, in planting woodlands. Um, so we, we don't see that kind of figures in the budget. So how are you going to how are you going to achieve the target that we've already been missing for a number of years, and we, you know we've a backlog to catch up on? So that the specific question there. Well, Joe, well, well, well I, I, are you going to answer that, I, Cabinet Secretary? Or, well, or? to save time, I'm ha ha happy to pass to Joe. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, we have failed to meet the target. Um, going back the way and we recognised this in fact I was in front of your predecessor committee in 2014 um, we recognised it under the last SRDP programme and that the structure of the grants that we had that we were applying were not attractive enough for people to bring land forward for planting so although in, 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 that, in those years we had budget and we were handing back a significant amount of budget at the end of year because demand wasn't there so we have never turned away a grant scheme because of lack of funding. So it's very demand-led. Now, we introduced a new grant scheme um, year before last. We listened to what the sector were telling us in terms of where we'd got the previous one, we'd got the detail of it wrong, and what we needed to do to bring more planting coming forward. They said to us we need to change the grant scheme and that the process for approval of forestry applications was becoming very burdensome and was putting people off from going for coming forward. We addressed the grant scheme with the last cap, we've introduced a new grant scheme and we always see in forestry and it's been seen in England and Wales as well, whenever we change to a new grant scheme, because forestry is a very long term business, because people making land use decisions need to think before they lock that land up, potentially in perpetuity in a new land use, they need to take their time. So we always see a dip when a new grant scheme comes in before we see what the impact has been on applications. I'm now very pleased to say that really since this summer, we have seen a substantial and sustained increase in applications coming forward to us as a result of the change in the grant scheme. However, it's not quite at the level yet to get us up to deal with the backlog, but we believe it's coming. And I also believe that the work that Jim McKinnon has done to make the application process more straightforward will again bring more people forward. So to get to the point on the number, I recognise the numbers that Stuart's given you, you know, we've, we've discussed them. Um, my first target is to get to the 10,000 um, because I think, you know, that's, that's a really important milestone to get to. 
We've looked at the applications that we have in the pipeline coming forward, that have come forward over the summer. We're getting more larger schemes, more commercial schemes, which are actually cheaper in terms of grants. So the amount of grant that we pay depends on the type of forest. And we think that we're going to get around eight to eight and a half thousand hectares um, of planting coming through in the year that we've got this budget for. That is the budget that we've, that we've put in, and that's why the number is in there at the 36,000 for forestry grants. There's additional land that will be planted by Forest Enterprise, which doesn't appear on the grant scheme, so 650 hectares coming from there. So the figure that's gone into the budget is what, it's what we do every year. We anticipate what we think demand will be, because if demand isn't there, we can't pay the money out on it. So that's maybe talked a bit too long, but that's the background to it all. I think subsequent years, with the impact of Jim McKinnon, with the real um, energy that the government has now putting behind woodland creation, and we have just seen so much more interest coming forward. All of my teams are working mm. flat out because of the increase in interest. I think we're going to see this build and build, and this step change that we're seeing this year, we, we hope to see next year, is the first of that process. Can I just uh, drill, drill down a wee bit more? Mm -hmm. Over the last number of years, we've seen the, 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 the mix of, of uh, broadleaves and conifers. Mm -hmm. It's been mostly broadleaves that's yep. been planted. Now, these aren't the forests that the, that the sawmills require to, you know, to keep them in business. So can we, can, we be, can we be assured that there's going to be a switch to more productive conifer forest yep. in, the, in the near future? Because I think that's very important. And that's, that was exactly what we did when we redesigned the grant scheme. And we are seeing in the applications, it's about 75% productive now right. coming through. So we have seen that change coming through. OK, good. Joe, just before we move on to the next question, can I just clarify then in, in my mind is that the planting target that we'd set for 100,000 hectares by 2022, yes. by your estimation, will not be achieved? Well, anything beyond next year... I don't know what's going to happen beyond next year. So for this year's budget, I, I think next year we're going to be around just over 9,000, I suspect, on the basis of current demand. The impact of uh, the approvals process and the wider impact of things like cap and Brexit on people's land use decisions, I can't predict. So I don't, I don't really want to say at this point where we're going to be with 100,000. Can't say that. Convener, the, the progress that's being made is, is extremely encouraging and it is important to pick up Joe's point that um, there hasn't in previous years been the demand and therefore part of what I have to do uh, is to uh, stimulate interest in investment in our forestry so that that appetite for demand increases and I believe that the signs are actually extremely positive as Mr Chapman will know uh, for uh, seeking that additional investment and that's why we're, we're looking at investment from various, various sources. Uh, from, from landowners, uh, possibly from pension funds, from communities. I would like to see the possibility of communities being able to have more opportunities to having ownership of a stake in forestry. So do many investors. So do many landowners. We've seen it in renewables. Why not see it more in forestry if we can? Uh, but we need to stim stimulate the appetite, and I believe we're doing that, and the figures of 8,500 coming through show a, a fairly substantial increase in the previous year. And from the two forestry summits that I've already held and from my engagement with the NGOs, it's clear there's a big consensus across the whole community, including those who uh, are concerned to protect our precious environment. And the last thing I would say is that, you know, the figures are quite stark. Um, the WWF recent report a couple of months back has opined that unless we increase the plantation of for product, productive species, not just productive, but native as well, but productive species, then by 2050, the UK will be importing 80% of the timber that it needs. I mean, that's quite a shocking uh, scenario when the climate, the temperate climate in Scotland and the rest of the UK is ideal for planting trees that are extremely useful for construction for sawmills and for a whole variety of purposes. So, you know, I think the signs are really right and I really hope, look forward to working with the committee to, uh, to, to use all the levers, not just financial, but financial to, uh, but substantially the, the increase in money that we're devoting to planting to help meet the, the targets that I think we all want to, to see. So, Cabinet Secretary, I, 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 
I would agree with you, it's very encouraging that we're seeing an increase, but it's still 4,500 hectares below what, what has been suggested, either 13,000 hectares that we should be targeting for this year. But maybe we could leave that there. Maybe I could ask a question now on the sales of the forest estate. Um, and if you could perhaps uh, just explain to me how, how the sales and the repositioning of the, the forest estate is, is decided upon. Yes, I'm certainly happy to do that. Um, over the, the last 10 years, convener, minister, ministers have mandated Forest Enterprise Scotland to sell lower priority land and forests in order to reinvest for higher priority objectives. And this programme, as you allude to, is called repositioning. And it has made significant contributions to four things, to woodland creation for climate change mitigation and future timber supply, also, community benefits through urban regeneration and land sales to communities, uh, supporting agriculture by creating farming opportunities for new entrants, uh, including nine starter farms, and delivering ecosystem benefits at a landscape scale. Now, on the, on the factual side of things, since April 2005, some 46,000 hectares, or 7% 7, 7 of the estate, has been sold. But over the same period, 30,000 hectares have been acquired. Uh, properties sold are selected with the help of cost-benefit analysis. Um, over £100 million has been raised and reinvested in the estate since 2005. Uh, the most recent significant sale was the barracks in Highland Perthshire, uh, nearly 4,500 hectares sold for £9.5 million and the largest single sale from the estate in, in several decades, um, but as, as well as land for woodland creation, a significant acquisition of nearly 2,400 hectares was made uh, for 7.4 million in 2014 at Rothy Marcus to secure the heritage value of this key part of the Cairngorms native pine woods. So repositioning has been a process convener that's been carried out for, for over a decade uh, and plainly, it's a sensible process, and it's sensible to reinvest the proceeds in the purposes, the objectives that we all wish to, uh, to see um, achieved. So receipts from woodland sales are reinvested in acquisitions, woodland creation, and other repositioning uh, objectives. So I hope that that paints a kind of headline picture, but I'm sure Joe O'Hara can... Can, can, oh, sorry, can, Simon Hodges when here. When Simon he, comes sorry, in, can sorry, I ask Simon, him sorry. just to address the, the, the logical follow-on to that? Could you confirm <coughs> to me that any capital received from sales or repositioning of the, of the National Forest Estate have been reinvested in the National Forest Estate and haven't been used for grant funding for, for, for trees? That's right. Um, the, the situation is that, the, <coughs> as the Cabinet Secretary indicated, um, the receipts from the repositioning sales have been reinvested uh, into woodland creation on the estate, um, our urban regeneration work, for example, within the central belt of Glasgow, um, uh, promoting agricultural integration and starter farms and um, acquisitions that help us to deliver ecosystem benefits at a landscape scale on the National Forest Estate. So, Simon, can I just be exactly clear in my brain? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that. Could you confirm that the money raised from sale of the National Forest Estate is not being used to fund grants for, for, for growing more trees? That's right. All repositioning sales receipts to date have been reinvested on the National Forest Estate. Okay, thank you. I think I'll leave it there. Mari, I think yours is the next question. Yes, it was just that the committee had had evidence from CONFOR which suggested, uh, which talked about planting in marginal sheep farming uh, areas. And that CONFOR suggested that you deliver four times as much income to the landowner and twice as much money into the local economy as what you would get from marginal sheep farming. So it was just really um, to ask if you think that there's merit in, in encouraging that uh, and planting in marginal sheep farming areas. And do you think that that would result in a saving to the public purse uh, as was suggested by Quanfor? I think Joe O'Hara is uh, prepared to answer this one. If it... Yeah, sure. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work with, um, with Confor, with National Sheep Association, with the NFU to look into this because following up from my previous question, one of the reasons why we haven't had more land planted is because the people that currently own that land 
don't choose to plant it with trees. A lot of the land that is the most suitable for tree planting, which is generally marginal um, agricultural land, is currently farmed and mostly farmed for sheep. So that's where we have this pinch point in terms of supply and demand. Now, obviously the sheep industry is going through a lot of changes at the moment as well, and we think there are real opportunities here both for um, the farming sector and the forestry sector both to benefit, because at the end of the day it's about the best use of land. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm familiar with the CONFOR report, and um, it did take a very specific example, but it is true if you look at the economics, um, you, you do look to make good returns from forestry. Um, relative to certain projections in terms of sheep farming. Um, and I think the employment, if you spread it over the full rotation, um, is comparable as well, if not better, in forestry. But probably the best outcome is if you've got an integrated use of land that's not entirely dedicated to one or the other. And that is the work that we're doing, both with the farming sector and with the forestry sector, to look to see whether we can make the best use of the land, be that trees, be that sheep, be that cattle, be that whatever, um, in order to better deliver the best for Scotland and the best return for the public purse. So, um, so in answer to your question, there are opportunities. There's no questions opportunities there. The farming sector recognises it and the forestry sector recognises it. And that's absolutely an area that we're working on and focusing on going forward. So the discussions are ongoing with Very that? Very much so, then, yeah. We've, had, um, we've held two um, events in the last year, which we call Sheep and Trees events. I say we, NSA, uh, the National Sheep Association, fronted them up. But it's very much a partnership with ourselves, the, the rest of the Scottish Government and uh, the NFU, to start helping farmers to see the real opportunities that are potentially there from growing trees as part of their business. OK, thank you. Uh, I th Cabinet Secretary, I think there's a sort of ancillary question towards marginal uh, uh, ground, which, which Gail would like to ask you. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, as you're aware, my constituency holds one of the biggest <coughs> peatland areas in the whole world. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about the budget line, which tells us about investment in peatland restoration, please. Um, <coughs> yes, there, there is a substantial investment being made in peatland um, restoration and uh, as we look for the precise figure, this, this was something that was uh, very much uh, being dealt with by my colleague Rosanna Cunningham substantially, although I think in our, in our budget, so we did work together to make a, a very substantial investment in, in uh, a peatland restoration, which of course is extremely important for um, the flow country uh, and uh, something that has been lobbied for pretty strongly by a number of stakeholders, including uh, NGOs, and will make, I think, a very significant uh, achievement towards our targets. I don't know if any officials want to uh, add anything. Yes, Mr. Baxter's uh, found the page. Yeah, ap apologies. Um, within the SRDP, um, the budget for uh, 15, or sorry, 16, 17 included uh, two. Uh, million uh, to cover peatland re restoration. Um, that's been increased by 8 million uh, in the 17-18 budget, so there's significant additional investment being put into peatland restoration. Um, I, I was going to ask, what exactly is this for? How is it going to be used? But I don't know if you're going to be able to answer that. We need to follow that up and happy to provide details. That would be good. I, I think we'll provide details through... Uh, Ms Cunningham, who, who, as members will appreciate, has been the Minister dealing with, with this issue, but obviously I'm delighted that uh, this investment is, is going to be made, and I'm sure that a very substantial part of it will support activity taking place in Gail Ross's um, cons constituency. So I uh, uh, imagine that will be a satisfactory outcome. It, it would be very helpful, Cabinet Secretary, sure. if you could maybe ask... Uh, for a quick response, because we, are, we, we, as you well know, as are all committees under a very tight time scale for reporting on the budget. Thank you. Is that sufficient? Yeah, we're, we're now going to move on, Cabinet Secretary, to cap payments. And 
and Stuart Stevenson is going to start. And before we go any further, I would now, as a farmer, would like to declare an interest that I have an interest in a farming business. I didn't do it earlier because I have no interest in, in, in trees and growing trees, but I do in farming. So, Stuart. Uh, uh, thank you very much, convener. And I have uh, registered agricultural holding, holding uh, of the grand total of three acres, from which I derive no income. Um, the farmer who uses it as seasonal grazing gets all the economic benefit. Um, I just wanted uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, there are increases uh, for CAP IT and for payments and inspection administration costs. Um, we've previously heard from you uh, of your commitment, your determination to make sure that IT does not get in the way of uh, effectively delivering payments uh, to farmers uh, in the coming year. Um, I take it that you can confirm to us that uh, these increases are directed at that and that we'll, we'll see that IT does not become an issue that we have to discuss uh, to any material extent in the, um, in the coming year. Yes, we th th thank you for that question. We, we do have confidence that the, the IT future system will deliver within its uh, budget the core components for CAP compliance. Uh, uh, and uh, it indeed would not have been possible to deliver payments to customers and meet compliance rules without a bespoke IT system. Obviously, this is a matter which has been the subject quite properly, convener of a great deal of parliamentary scrutiny, and I don't shy away from that. And I, I stand by everything I've said before, and I hope I've sought to deal with it in a straightforward uh, matter. Um, I think it's perhaps useful just to remind everyone that uh, the IT system was designed not just for one or two years, but for several years to come. And uh, I believe the figure is not in front of me here, but I think the, the total payments that it was designed to support are of the order of £4,000 million. In other words, it was an expensive system, yes, but one which was to be used as a tool for delivery of uh, the agricultural payments and a great deal of other payments across the rural um, community. And uh, it's important, I think, not to lose sight on that. So. Um, uh, so, yes, mistakes have occurred in the past, and, and you know, we've, we've put our hands up to that and been quite candid about that, which I think uh, farmers at least appreciate. And, and I was uh, pleased that the uh, National Loan Payment Scheme uh, was able to benefit, I believe, uh, uh, from memory, just over 13,000 uh, farmers with a very considerable injection into the rural community at an important time of year, namely the first fortnight in November early enough for farmers who wished to do so to make investment in a, and you know I was at AgriScot where quite a lot of investment happily was taking place a, much to the pleasure of the uh, stallholders I can assure you so uh, although there are problems uh, you know I, I hope that we're now turning the corner and I, I just want to finish by saying that you know this remains my top priority to get it right and when I say that that, that means that I am spending time as I did last week meeting the chief executive of CGI, the company that's the main contractor, uh, working with him to ensure that things are on track to avoid a repetition next year of what we saw last year, and we all wish to do that. So I just want to give that personal assurance that, that you know, I am absolutely on the case with civil servants who are spending a huge amount of time and effort to get things right, convener, because I know that uh, many members of this committee have quite rightly been pursuing this on behalf of their constituents uh, and therefore, it's absolutely essential we get it right. And that does require the necessary budgetary commitment to be made. Can I, can I just uh, <clears throat> complete my interest in this? Um, the level four figures for Pillar 1 uh, show no inflows and outflows in your budget at all. Uh, and the note is that the funding is solely from the EU European Agricultural Guarantee Fund. I wonder if you can just confirm in cash flow terms, because with our now distributing money earlier to farmers than has been the case historically, um, not all of it, but substantial early payments, that the cash flow of those payments we are making matches the cash flow of the payments from the EU Agricultural Guarantee Fund. Um, well, that's, that, that is a, a technical question. Obviously, I want to give you a, a, an answer which is technically accurate. Uh, 
and it wasn't one which uh, I was anticipating. So if I may, convener, um, I will come back very quickly with the precise answer to that question in letter form. To Mike Rumbles, can I just try and drill down just something onto what you said there? My understanding that in 2014-15, the budget for the Payments and Inspectorate admin was 34 million. In 2015-16, it rose to 45 million. In 16-17, it rose to 55 million. And in 17-18, it's rising to 62.9 million. It seems to be a massive increase uh, with a computer system which should be, as, as you're saying, Cabinet Secretary, delivering a payment system that, that should work for Scotland. Uh, my calculations suggest it, 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 it's almost double, and, and I wondered if you could explain that to me, please. Well, uh, well, I can come back to you, Convener, with the, after we've checked the figures for the previous years of 2014-15. Uh, it's undoubtedly the case that the, the new CAP, the reformed CAP, is massively, as you know, uh, massively more complex than its predecessor uh, because of the agreement reached with all parties, including the NFU, that there should be uh, a differentiation of uh, three categories of land. Uh, now, that added massively to the complexity of the system. Uh, uh, that was an agreement. I think uh, everybody supported that, so far as I'm aware, all parties at the time. Uh, it was a designed to achieve desirable outcomes, but the concomitant was that it massively increased the complexity of the system. And when you take account of the, the, uh, uh, the hundreds of thousands of holdings, uh, the necessity of absolute accuracy in GPS calculations on several points for each field, each component of each of hundreds of thousands of holdings, you quite simply have an extremely complex system. And therefore, I think one doesn't really need to be possessed of a brain of the scale of Einstein to realize that it is going to be more expensive to administer. So yes, the costs are more, but they were bound to be more. Uh, and these decisions taken prior to this session of Parliament are decisions that it falls to me to implement and I'm determined to implement it to make sure that the prime objective, which is not for me uh, with respect pouring over what's happened in the past, but looking forward to the future, is that farmers get their money in time. That's what I want to secure next year, and I can assure you that is where my officials' efforts are determined, and that is something that I personally oversee and guarantee every single week of my short tenure in this office and deal with the system uh, with all its complexities in order to get the money out. And I'm very pleased, for example, just to give you one statistic, that the, uh, the uptake of the SEF forms has uh, substantially increased since uh, last year uh, and the success in delivery of the, of the National Loan Scheme uh, I think is a positive sign uh, and the next report, and I think I've agreed to do this, convener, so no doubt we'll have more time to come back to this uh, happy topic, uh, uh, will be at the end of January, and I very much look forward to updating the committee at that time. Uh, uh, and Cabinet Secretary, can I just say that we, we have agreed that you will come back uh, in January, uh, yes, towards the end of January, and I, and I welcome your confirmation of that. And at, at that stage, I, I, I would like to, to delve down on, on why the computers doubled in cost and the cost for, for implementing the system has doubled in cost because I, I don't think we have time to go through all the nitty gritty now. And, and Mike would like to ask the next question. Thank you, Convener. Just note on that point of the, the IT system from the draft budget. Um, with the Audit Commission saying it had gone up to 172 million, now this is rising to over 42 million. It's a, it means it's over 200 million pounds being spent so far in this, this coming year on this system, which is a heck of a lot of money. Anyway, my, I've got two parts to my question, really. Minister, you, you keep mentioning that um, it's important that the farmer, farming businesses get their money on time, and you said that you were very pleased with the uptake of the loan scheme that the Scottish Government have got. But of course, with one third of farm businesses not claiming the loan scheme, 
and the remaining two-thirds only receiving 80%, what it actually means is that over £200 million that would normally go into the Scottish economy each December isn't going into the Scottish economy, the rural economy, in this period. So I'm not just focusing on how much is being going to the farmers, but the fact that our whole rural economy is affected by this, um, not just farm businesses. My question really is in two parts. How confident are you that, 95, that the Commission, European Commission's target of 95% of entitlement payments, that's the full entitlement payments, will be paid to farm businesses by, by June? And my second part of my question is, I've been trying to find in the budget, the budget line for the loans. Now, it's my understanding that NF, I have been told that this money for the loan scheme comes from the Scottish government's own budget. And yet I can't find any lines in the draft budget for the, for the loan scheme. Could you direct me to where I can find it? And um, is it actually, or, or are these actual monies actually going to be paid back to the Scottish government before the farming businesses then receive their entitlement? Okay, um, well, there's several components of two, mm -hmm. and I'll try to, to, to deal with each of them. Um, first of all, I, I think it's, it's relevant to, to point out, and Mr. Rumbles quite rightly mentions the penalties, and obviously we, we have a specific duty to do everything we can to minimise the uh, possibility of penalties and disallowance arising. And this in itself is, uh, is a very exacting task because the EU rules are extremely detailed and very demanding. In fact, our benefits analysis demonstrated that developing a compliance system would avoid no less than £276 million of financial penalties to 2021-22. Now, I just mention that because that is a reminder, I think, of <laughs> the importance of having a, a compliant uh, a, a, a system. Um, secondly, in relation to the loan scheme, um, I'm not quite sure that I would accept the one-third figure. I think the 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 uptake was um, uh, was substantially more than two-thirds. Uh, however, the point, I think, is, is a well-made one. That there was a su substantial number of farmers that didn't take out the, the payment. Uh, and I want to make it absolutely clear to the committee that, that you know, this is something that I was aware of, that we took gr great steps to encourage all farmers to take out, out the, the payments. We explained that no interest would arise, except in a very unlikely, a very remote scenario for most uh, applicants, namely that it turned out that the payment that they received 80% of the total was more than their actual entitlement, and they then paid late, paid the, the excess back late. In, in almost all cases, no interest accrued. Now, what we did convene, and just to, and I haven't an opportunity to say this, the, 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 the question has been asked, I think it needs to be answered. Uh, I spoke personally last week to the head official who was handling as the project team this matter. Uh, and uh, I had been involved in numerous, numerous exchanges with him over the last weeks. And he confirmed to me that there were steps taken to contact farmers who hadn't applied for the payment to ascertain why they didn't do so. Uh, and this, uh, in all cases, was a decision taken by the farmer. They decided that they did not want to take up the payment. Now, that is entirely a matter for each individual. Each individual is quite entitled to do as he or she wishes. But I just want to make it clear that I made sure that steps were taken, both in public publication of uh, pleas in the Scottish Farmer and the other uh, and specialised press and the general press, and also individually by ensuring that individual farmers who had not sought the payment were contacted to ascertain why they did not every single one, but a sample were, were contacted to say, look, you know, the money is available if you want it, there's no interest on it, except in this remote scenario, will you take up the money? Uh, and just the, the response I got from the head of the project team was that it was an individual taken, individual decision taken. Uh, and, you know, that, that is absolutely a, the, the right of each individual. Now, as far as the, the last question that uh, Mr. Mr. Rumbles raised, I think it was in relation to how the matter was financed. It was financed internally by the... Scottish Government in respect of an internal transfer to allow us to have sufficient funding 
uh, to uh, fund the loan scheme up to a certain value. Uh, and there was, of course, a cap applied, I think, at 150,000 uh, to, to, uh, to put a cap on the total estimated liability. So it was done by internal transfer. That internal transfer will require to be paid back uh, by the end of the, uh, by a certain time in the financial year. Uh, and I'm happy, convener, if it would assist to provide full details by letter to the committee of how that operates, because it's a perfectly legitimate question. Uh, uh, and uh, if, if that would help, I'm happy to do so. Or alternatively, Mr. Baxter, Mr. Baxter, if you would prefer, can give some more details right now. Could, could I ask specifically, this is a very important point, because it came as a surprise to me that this is not European money, this is money, this is money from the Scottish Government. It's, it's Scottish Government's own money. And because of European rules, that's, I believe that's the case. So this money, that has gone to just over, I take the point, it's not, not two-thirds, it's just over two-thirds of our farm businesses. Um, and only 80% of those, uh, of that, of what we think of their entitlement. Will the farmers, under European rules, actually have to, it's not just a paper exercise, but will they have to actually pay that money back to no. the Scottish government? I want, I'd like to know if, from, from Mr. Baxter if that's the case. Um, I'll need to provide further information. In terms of how the, the budget's presented, um, the, the loan schemes are financed through the financial transactions budget, so that's for loans to third parties effectively, mm -hmm. uh, and are offset uh, when the cap payments then uh, are made. Um, the plans are in place to ensure our financial transaction bu uh, budget obligations are met, such that we operate within the allocated resource uh, in the budget, and I can provide further detail. Yeah, but my question then. really is, because of European rules, do the farm businesses actually have to pay the Scottish Government back the money, rather than just being a paper exercise? No, no um, it's, it's up to us to repay the sums, if, if, if you like, transferred from the financial transactions budget uh, to the budget to enable the national payment scheme uh, to be made. So farmers will not have to pay that money back, or, nor should they. I mean, that would be absurd. Uh, yeah. You know, they, we've paid them the money. We've okay. made arrangements yeah. to enable us to do so with a short-term internal transfer. It's a perfectly sensible thing to do. Uh, uh, I was determined to do it. Uh, obviously, we worked closely with Mr. Mackay, the Finance Secretary, to enable that, and I was delighted that he, showing the commitment of the Scottish Government to Scottish farmers, made sure that we were able to offer farmers early, earlier payment than normal convener. It was the right thing to do. It was one, it was a, a measure which uh, it was welcomed, as I understand it, by the, the National Farmers Union, quite rightly, uh, and also welcomed by every single farmer outside this parliament that I've spoken to. Point there, because I think you've clarified that the money won't have to be paid back to, to yes. be reclaimed. So I'm, I'm happy to leave that there and develop that line of questioning if we feel there's, there's a greater need to do so when you come back at the end of January. Mm -hmm. We're gonna move on, if we may, to digital connectivity a subject that crosses all party boundaries, and, and, and Jamie's going to, to, to lead uh, on that. Thank you, Convener. Uh, welcome, Cabinet Secretary and other members. Uh, so, yes, we could turn to digital connectivity. I think it's important. This is a, an analysis of the budget, so I'll try and keep it uh, related to uh, budget questions. Uh, it's, it's important we, we look at those in specific. So, um, I think if we could look, first of all, at the budget for next year, the line that's in here, the capital uh, commitment for around 110 million pounds. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned it in his opening statement. I wondered, therefore, we could drill down a little bit into that number. Um, if, for example, he could uh, provide more details as to what portion of the budget for next year is actually forming part of the funding for the two existing contracts that the government has with BT on the 95%, or, or is that a portion of that budget for next year going to be part of the next procurement for the R100 uh, project? That, that would be a first short question. And I think the reason I ask that is a more general issue that this is just a snapshot of the 2017 budget. So it's very difficult for the committee uh, to really get a feel for the, uh, the overall cost of that, uh, reaching that last 5%. So therefore, if the gov has the government given any thought to the overall cost over the next couple of years to that, to give us an idea of where the next year's budget is a suitable proportion of that budget? Uh, and I'm happy to clarify my question if it's been overly sure. complicated. Apologies. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, to answer your, your, your <coughs> question, um, uh, which was uh, which part of the 
total capital allocation of 112 uh, is being used in order to uh, uh, deliver the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme. The answer is 21 million of that. Um, as I think members will be aware, the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme is moving towards completion. It's a uh, 400 million pound uh, budget in total. That covers the two contracts, one through HIE for the north of Scotland, which was moved forward first, and the other administered by the Scottish Government for the rest of Scotland. Uh, and uh, that uh, the, up to 21 million will be used to deliver the, fi the final phase of the 400 million pound um, programme, um, a, which is extending BT's fibre broadband network into non-commercial areas. So this, this investment will extend fibre access to at least 95% of premises across Scotland by the end of 2017. And members might be interested to know, and these figures are still to be audited and finalised, but over 697,000 697, homes and businesses um, have been connected. 90% at uh, the super fast broadband uh, speed. Uh, and that means that by the end of the contract, the coverage will be 95%. Had it not been for this contract convener, and this is a really important point, I think, the planned commercial coverage would only have reached 66%. So as a result of this contract, and it, it has been delivered, I think, reasonably well, and I think Audit Scotland and others have recognised that, Ofcom have recognised that, uh, as faster progress than down south, uh, that as a result of this project, 95% of premises will be covered by the end of 2017 next year, uh, 679,000 are present to be audited, uh, and of those, the vast majority receiving super fast speed. So, a uh, of course, many, many people haven't yet got coverage, and the next part of what we do and other elements of the capital budget are, of course, going to start to, to address that problem of all the many communities that, through the MSPs here and in Parliament, quite rightly ask for answers. But I think it's important to recognise that you, know, you need to, uh, to design, to survey, to build, to connect, to activate. There are five processes to connect broadband. Each one of those stages can result in difficulties and delays. That's the nature of any uh, project to uh, install utilities. So none of this is straightforward, but good progress has, has been made, and I'm delighted to have had the chance just to outline those facts. Yeah, I, I, th I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that um, detailed answer. I think uh, the only thing that was missing is just the answer to the second point in the question. I think it's important we get a feel for the scale of the, 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 this last 5%. So assuming that 21 million of the 112 uh, is related to, this, uh, to the existing contracts, does that therefore mean that the budget allocated ne next year uh, f uh, of around 90 million uh, will form part of this uh, remainder budget? So the question, original question was, have the go has the government given any thought to the overall cost yeah. of what it might need uh, to uh, reach that 100% commitment because it is very hard to tell if 90 is, you know, scratching the surface or if it's a, a suitable amount that's been reserved as part of an... I appreciate the tender process hasn't started and the procurement process has, has yet to take place, but I, I'd like to think that as part of working out next year's gov uh, budget, the government has an, an overall picture of the potential cost of reaching 100%. That, sure. That's guess, just, my question. A very reasonable just, sorry, just before you answer that, Cabinet Secretary, and give you a, a moment to gather your thoughts, Gail wants to, to supplement that specific point with, with, with another question, so I'd like to bring her in now, please. Thanks, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the, the 112 million and, and the 21 million of that for the current programme, um, in the Audit Scotland report, there was, there was mentioned several times of 42 million that was going to be used um, for the programme <laughs> next year. Um, and at the audit committee, we asked Scottish government officials where that was going to be used, and they said it was part of the budget for the next year's programme. I see no mention of it, and I just wonder, is that part of the 112 million? Is it, do we know where it falls in the budget line? Has it disappeared? Is it still there? Where has it gone? Um, well, I haven't the Audit Scotland 
report in front of me, but that did predate the preparations for this budget. It did. So, you know, by definition, I think we must be looking at a different figure. But I can, I, I think, in response to both members, say that, the, you know, the most of the balance of the 112 will be looking forward and will be designed to uh, dealing with two things in particular, uh, principally, at least, um, the 100% super fast broadband program and also mobile telephony. Um, so there will be large sums allocated to tackling both. Now, um, you know, obviously, convener, I think Mr. Mr. Uh, Green quite rightly alluded to this. Um, you know, there's a number <coughs> of points we need to make. First of all, um, the government, Scottish UK, is not the default provider of broadband. I mean, it's commercial operators that are making the money out of this. They install the broadband, or one particular company, and then they make money out of it by supplying customers with broadband. So let's not forget that there is a commercial driver here. And we are not, the, the taxpayer is not the default provider of uh, the laying of utilities. Uh, and I think it's important just to spell that out because all too often the political debate presupposes that somewhere there's a, a piece of legislation passed in Westminster, which of course has the reserve responsibility over these matters that says the taxpayer shall fund broadband for everybody. I mean, that is not the case. Uh, and I think, and I hope, all members would subscribe to the principle that we should get, of course, the commercial operators to fulfill their responsibilities because they will go on and, and make a profitable business out of it, uh, as is, is reasonable, but not with the public sector being the soulless investor. And that, in turn, means that in the negotiations that we have, we must be very careful, convener, not to prejudice those negotiations uh, by, uh, you know, by being overly candid about uh, what we want to bring to the, the table. But all of that said, you know, we, we have a major commitment in our manifesto. We work very closely with broadband and mobile companies. We have the Mobile Action Plan in Scotland, the only one in the UK. We have had the accolade that Ofcom has said that we're making faster progress than the rest of the UK. Audit Scotland has recognised the progress we're making. But all of that said, that's no, there's no comfort to people out there, particularly in the rural parts of Scotland, who are not yet getting the coverage they want. And the last thing I would say is that let's not forget either that other countries have taken a different approach from the UK government. They've taken an outside-in approach. Other countries have made a policy decision that there should be provided to their rural communities proper mobile and broadband access by regulating the industry in order to require them to produce that. That was not the decision that was taken by the UK government. Instead, they wanted to maximise the profits by sale of spectrum from mobile. And I've written to Matt Hancock, we've yet to agree a meeting, I wrote to him some considerable time ago, and saying, when you get round to 5G spectrum auctions, Will you go for the outside-in approach by maximising the regulation and thereby providing the maximum opportunity of people in rural Scotland to have proper connections, or will you not? And I look forward to getting a very positive answer, Cabinet working Secretary, constructively with the UK Cabinet, government. Cabinet Secretary, you've made your point very forcefully, but we've drifted slightly away from the budget, if I, if I might be so bold as to say. And, and, and Jamie wants to really, I think, drill down on, on, on the provision to the, to the non-commercial areas uh, and, and community broadband. And, and perhaps I could ask him in that direction. Yeah, please. I'm happy to move on. To, I think uh, community broadband Scotland is a, is a fine place to move on to. Uh, just on the points that the Cabinet Secretary made, however, I think uh, whilst uh, uh, the government uh, doesn't have any mandate to deliver broadband, I think most people would perceive broadband as a utility these days in the same way they would as gas, electricity or water. And I think for the future of, uh, of, of digital Scotland and our ability to compete in the world stage, I think it's important that broadband is available to every household uh, and business in the country. So uh, that, that's only an additional comment I would make. On Community Broadband Scotland, I think uh, there's some excellent work being done there. I'd like to first of all praise the work that, that members of Community Broadband Scotland have done thus far on the budget they've had. Uh, there isn't any mention of it specifically in the draft budget. Uh, therefore, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, what the plans are for Community Broadband Scotland in terms of its future and also its funding? Uh, well, I mean, I, I would subscribe to the, um, uh, to the sentiment that Mr Green has quite rightly expressed. We all want to see people getting proper connectivity and, and all members, I think, here have, have made that point uh, very forcibly from time to time. So we all want to get to the same place, but it shouldn't just be at the public expense. I think that's really the, the main point. 
I wanted to make. As far as the specific question is concerned, Mr Green, you know, plainly we want to continue to support Community Broadband Scotland to carry on the work it's, it's uh, been doing. It, uh, it, it uh, ha has approved funding for 77 communities at various stages of project development process and is supporting over 100 communities uh, further. Um, of the 77 projects, 16 covering over 4,200 premises have received capital grant funding totalling over 2.1 uh, million. Uh, and therefore, you know, as with Mr Green, I, I do think that Community Broadband Scotland has been uh, performing a very useful and valuable role for some remote rural communities, but we will need to, uh, to tender uh, for uh, further provision to reach the 100% target a, a, in the course of next year. Uh, and a, I wonder perhaps if, if Colin Cook, who's, who leads on this, might perhaps give a little bit more information about the funding aspects to the committee with your permission, Convener. I'd, I'd be delighted to do that. And, and just if I, I may, to pick up on the, the previous point, you noted that there were a number of different variables that have to be um, taken into account as we agree forward funding for uh, the Reaching 100% project. One of those, and one of the key ones of those, is the open market review, which is currently ongoing and will close at the beginning of January, which will allow us to um, get a, an up-to-date understanding of the commercial plans of, of commercial providers across Scotland. And that, I think, is a really important piece of information to allow us to define an appropriate procurement strategy. Within the, the budget, there is provision for uh, the running costs of community broadband Scotland. Broadly speaking, they, 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 they cost in the order of about a million pounds a year directly from the Scottish Government to, to operate. Um, but I think the critical thing for the projects that are in train, and uh, community broadband Scotland have around about 19 projects that they're they're looking to deliver in the, the, the months ahead. Uh, they do also have access to the um, Scottish Rural Development Programme funding of up to, to £9 million. So I think the funding is available for Community Broadband Scotland to continue to do the kind of uh, good and impressive work it has been doing to date. Stuart, do you want to come in on the back of that? Uh, it was a much earlier point to convene. No, I just wanted the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary said, and it's very welcome, 697,000 houses now are connected for superfast broadband. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary actually meant that the, the superfast broadband is now available to 697,000. Only a proportion of those for whom it's available will have chosen to connect. And I just thought it would be helpful perhaps to get that uh, clarity as to what the figure actually means. A, well, that's a very sensible question, and maybe Mr. Stevenson is envisaging a future career as a spin doctor. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, but to be serious, the, the, the figure the figure actually is 679,000. So I've never yet been able to correct oh, Stuart sorry. Stevenson on anything, but it wasn't 697; it was 679. But All yes, right. okay. the, po <laughs> the point is well made that that provides access. It doesn't necessarily mean that every single household or business will choose to to avail uh, themselves of of the. That's fine, service. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Yes, just on broadband, and, and then I want to move on, if I may, from broadband to, to mobile uh, applications. Jim. So just on, on, on budget, uh, so as, as you're probably aware, the um, uh, Chancellor announced uh, substantial investment in digital infrastructure across the UK, uh, supporting fibre connectivity and also uh, 5G mobile connectivity. Uh, the number is around £740 million uh, through the uh, National Productivity Investment Fund. Uh, I, I presume uh, that that is additional uh, funding to what's in, ex in your existing budget for the R100 uh, project. I just wonder what conversations the Cabinet Secretary has had uh, with the UK Government on this additional uh, investment announcement made by the Chancellor in autumn and, and how that will tally up with the, government, the Scottish Government's own plans in terms of uh, making sure that Scotland, you know, in a sense, benefits from any proportion of that funding that's been made available by the UK government? Um, well, I've had no ch discussions with the Chancellor of any description whatsoever. <laughs> um, we weren't informed of the announcement in advance, uh, but we do believe, as Mr Green appears to believe, that we should have a share of this funding. But as yet, we've had absolutely no confirmation of that. Uh, it's a very substantial amount of money, and therefore we would expect that Scotland would receive a due share. But 
We weren't told about it in advance, and we haven't heard anything since. We have obviously pressed for an answer. Maybe Mr. Cook could expand on that. <laughs> yes, I mean, just to, to clarify, I mean, we, we have uh, met with official, at official level to d discuss this. We've started the, progress, uh, the process of, uh, uh, of seeing the contribution that this might make to Scotland. Um, the plans are not, the, the plans for deploying that money and how it will break down between technologies and approaches are not yet um, firm, so we don't know. Um, precisely how it will contribute to um, our targets in Scotland. But we are engaged in that process, and I think there's a, there's a very constructive relationship at official level, and they're going to look at some of the work that we've been doing on 5 or preparing the ground for 5G, for example, which I think has lessons for the rest of the UK, and we're very, very proud of. So there are, just to confirm that you have had... The, at official level, official we, uh, we're having... Uh, we, we're continually in dialogue with BD UK. I mean, they've been a major funder of uh, the Superfast Broadband Programme. So those, those discussions are ongoing, and clearly, when those kind of announcements are made, and as um, the Cabinet Secretary said, we weren't consulted prior to that um, <coughs> announcement. Uh, you know, those, those things are bound to be discussed at official level. Thank you. <coughs> Tell me, Ray, did you want to come in on that? Because your question is sort of linked into that. It, 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 is, it is slightly um, in that you, you spoke about discussions with the Westminster government and um, talking about priority given to rural areas. I'm wondering in the next um, contract that is going out whether that will be designed to give priority to the most hard to reach areas. Because while we've seen a huge number being connected, there are still areas where there is little or no hope of connection. And I, I would say a building concern. Hey, well, yes, that's a very reasonable point. And, and you know, plainly, a, the purpose of the commitment that the Scottish National Party made, and now as a government that we have accepted and we are, uh, we are um, going to fulfil, is to provide that universal access to broadband by the end of this session of Parliament. And to do so with, with all due speed. Um, it, I stress it's a very complex task and, and in the past mistakes have been made about the specification of contracts. Uh, the mobile infrastructure programme, for example, was a complete disaster when instead of 80 pr new mobile masts, there was only three delivered, I believe, in the uh, UK programme. So it's very easy to get it wrong. Uh, it's far more difficult to get it right. And obviously we want to work with the committee in that respect. Um, but I did write to Mr. Hancock in October about this particular matter. Uh, uh, I think his office contacted me last week, uh, and we hope to meet in the new year. Uh, and I will be arguing that the kind of approach that has been set out by the member is the kind of approach that I think would be fair to see a, some redressing of the balance for rural Scotland and the islands of Scotland, because they're too often at the coup's tail of things. So, you know, this is certainly something that's uh, close to my heart, close to the member's heart and, uh, and other members, Gail Ross is, as well, obviously, because we tend to have far more people in our, in our constituencies who lack connectivity that perhaps people in towns and cities don't. So, uh, so the, the approach of requiring operators to do more for the rural and island parts of the country, I think, is, is one that we have and will advocate uh, when I meet Mr Hancock. And I hope that that meeting, after a couple of months of delay and non-response, can be arranged early in the new year. Can, can, can I, sorry, can I, because you had made that point, can I ask if that point is, is something that you're going to use when you design your own new contract, well, the see, Scottish Government's contract? Well, is yes. that the approach you're going to take about prioritising the most remote rural areas because we've almost seen kind of the low-hanging fruit being collected and people are getting more and more frustrated that the people who desperately need this because of their location are being left behind to an extent. Uh, well, well, obviously the approach we're taking is to, to reach 100%, so plainly we, we want to, uh, to, to reach out to remote rural and island locations. I mean, we, we can't achieve everything at once. It, the processes are are, are effectively a type of kind of civil engineering contract, uh, but the approach broadly is the one we want to take. But I was drawing a distinction between the approach we will take with a tender exercise to be carried out uh, to extend to rural and island areas super fast broadband or access to super fast broadband with the powers of the UK government that as the possessor of the legal competence have the power of regulation. It's not just about money, it's also about regulation. 
and regulation. In other words, what you ask the mobile operators to do in the case of mobile telephony uh, and in the case of broadband dictates what they will do. I mean, plainly, commercial operators can be in a tend not to do more than they have to do unless they can do so profitably, uh, and most profitably, to deploy their capital in the most profitable fashion. So that's why the approach to other countries have taken an outside-in approach in the EU, precisely because um, they believe, for policy reasons, that it's important they do so, is one that we have advocated that the UK government emulate, not dissociate themselves from, and I will continue to do that with Mr Hancock, and I will happily report back to this committee as to whether or not the UK government accedes to the approach that, uh, that, that Rhoda Grant and I would like to see taken. Can, you want can, to, I don't can, know if Mr Cook wants to add just, anything to that. Just, to, just to, to, to pick up on the, the point directly, and, and obviously we haven't yet designed the procurement strategy, and I, I mentioned earlier that the open market review is going to be critical for doing this. But um, clearly, achieving 100% um, will be a mix of government funding and commercial activity. And uh, there are many urban premises that are not connected to superfast broadband. And the likelihood is that commercial uh, companies are more likely to be able to address those premises than they are those in far um, rural premises. And therefore, the balance of government investment and the timing of government investment is likely to be skewed to, to rural first, if I can put it like that, within any procurement strategy. Do you want to come back? That was the answer. Was can, can, Cabinet Secretary, could I just have a bit of clarity, if I may, please? Uh, in the draft budget, it states we're working with mobile operators to develop programmes to address 4G coverage gaps, i.e. no G. Could you explain to me, please, <coughs> what plans you have afoot and what budget has been satisfied to, impl <coughs> to implement the mobile action plan agreed with the four UK operators? And, and what specifically monies sure. have been set aside for that, please? Uh, uh, okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll pass to Mr Coop specifically for the money, but the, the, there are several components of the Mobile Action Plan, and they're all very important, and the non-monetary plans are, are extremely important as well. Uh, and they include, for example, uh, working to extend permitted development rights uh, so that uh, the um, construction of mobile masts uh, can be completed as swiftly as possible, uh, and indeed the applications can be aggregated. Uh, in this work, we have, in the Scottish Government, had a great cooperation from local authorities. In fact, in the Convention of the Highlands and Islands, the consensus view, as I think it's fair to characterise it, was that the quicker we can get on with this, the better. That was certainly the Highland Council view at, the, at COHE, a very useful means of working together in these matters. Uh, and also, uh, the higher masts, the, the higher the mast, the greater the radius of coverage. Um, in other words, the higher the mast, quite obviously, the, 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 the area and the number of people that, that can get a signal from that mast is of value. In addition to that, we have a, a, another segment of work with the emergency services, because plainly they have masts. Uh, and uh, I know that there is good work done through, a, through that uh, particular aspect. And also we have had a rates relief pilot in the national parks for mobile operators. Uh, that's another aspect which mobile operators are you know, looking, uh, looking at and we are looking at possibilities there and end. And we have also made budgetary provision to uh, supplement the work we're doing what I'm not particularly keen on getting involved in specifics at this stage. I'm happy to brief the committee privately. I'd prefer to keep our powder dry for commercial confidential reasons because, you know, we, we don't want to start prejudicing negotiations, do we, convener, in relation to these matters. I think we all want to get the very best, as has been acknowledged, from, a, from private operators. But perhaps Mr. Cook could expand on the importance of that aspect. Well, I mean, I think I mean, you, you referenced the mobile um, action plan and our principal um, investment, certainly this year, rising from that plan is, is going to be in terms of 4G. Um, we are working currently with Scottish Futures Trust to develop a, a, an, an infill plan 
for 4G, and that should be um, that work should be completed um, by the spring, and I think that will define the procurement strategy and therefore um, the, the the amount of the budget that will be allocated to mobile. And as uh, the cabinet secretary said, we're also working with UK government to take advantage of the UK-wide emergency services mobile communication program. Um, trying to um, develop that program in a way that adds greatest value to mobile coverage across Scotland. Colin, I think Gail wants to come in on the back of, of that to ask actually where the gaps are, not necessarily on 4G, but where the gaps of mobile connection are and what's being done about that. So I'll let Gail ask that question. Thanks, convener. Um, yes, you won't be surprised to know that in some areas of my constituency you can't get a mobile phone <coughs> signal full stop, let alone 2, 3 or you know, 4G would be absolutely fantastic and I'm sure it's the same for quite a lot of other people. When we're talking about infill and you talk about 4G, there'd be quite a lot of people that want me to ask, when are they going to get a mobile phone signal full stop? And yeah, and that I specifically ask you to, uh, as this is budget, to say is there money set aside within the budget to help that, help ensure that that happens? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I mean, there there is money. Um, we, we we've done the figures. The um, we said the only contractual commitment in the the budget from the 112.1 million was the 20.9 um, uh, commitment to the digital superfast program. So that additional money is available for a combination of building the 100% um, overall broadband and for mobile. Um, there are two pre separate procurements that are required to deliver those two strategies. One of those is around mobile infill. And so, yes, in that sense, money is available to improve and to fill in mobile coverage across Scotland. Whether I can offer a particular um, <laughs> commitment to your constituents in every place, I mean, I'd have to come back and look at the, when we develop the planning um, and, and do it at that stage. But there is money that will be made available to improve mobile signals across Scotland. And there's another Co important aspect that hasn't been raised, and, uh, uh, and I think it's important just to mention, and I picked this up from meetings with a number of operators, is that the, the more people that will use the mobile phones, the, the more clutter there will be, the more take up of signal in cities, the more is the propensity and likelihood in, in future years that there will need to be an, an enhancement of the existing signal. In other words, you can't just assume that, you know, Glasgow has got its signal and everything is fine because more and more people are using mobile. The signal is, is therefore being kind of used up and therefore uh, don't, we shouldn't think of it that it is purely a matter for rural Gaps may well occur in cities and towns in future simply because of the massive increase in uptake in mobile devices. Uh, and therefore, this is a dynamic, I mean, I'm not a technical expert, a, a, a convener, but this is a dynamic area. And in substantial meetings with, with mobile operators, you know, the, there, are, there are many aspects, as, uh, other aspects as well that we need to, to bear in mind for, mm -hmm. um, for those that represent uh, urban constituencies. Ca uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you for that. Can I go back to Colin and just say you, you're not prepared to give Gail uh, an assurance that everyone in, in Caithness will, will have mobile signal? <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I, I, I think, I think what, I I, what, I, what I said was we're developing a, a, a plan for infilling of uh, I, mobile. That plan will look at individual areas and I'm sure that Caithness will be part of that planning. And I, so I, 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 I was, <laughs> I, I'm trying to drill you down and ask you have, you, have you a figure within the budget in mind to allow infilling at, to be done during the course of this year because that's what we're being asked to look at as a committee yeah the budget figure i mean i, I know it won't all be spent in case now i i i think it's <laughs> no sutherland I, 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 and I ross will get the right balance right, I'm, I'm i'm sure there'll be uh, due consideration given to to, to to those areas of the country um now at the moment um I, I think the precise allocation of budget between mobile and building the fiber infrastructure for for for, for um R100 really is subject to the completion of open market reviews and the development of those procurement exercises. But we are confident that we have made the overall allocation to enable those two programs to, to, to go ahead in the way in which they need to go ahead. You're not going to answer my question, which may be wise, but uh, John, I think you're next. Yes, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, we've spent a lot of time talking about physical infrastructure, and clearly that's important. But, uh, I mean, figures we've seen are that of households with incomes over 40,000, 98% have home internet access, whereas with households with incomes under 15,000, only 60% have home internet access. Is there something in the budget that can help address that? Hey, Colin, do you want to cover that? I may, if I, if I um, 
I could, because I think this is at the heart of our efforts to promote digital participation and, and comes up and comes under the responsibility of uh, Ms. Hislop as, as Cabinet Secretary. And I do think we've made, and I think previous committees have acknowledged this, tremendous progress in support, you know, developing the basic digital skills across Scotland to the point where we now have the highest level of basic digital skills of any of nations of, the, of these islands. So I think it's a really good positive story and I think the work that's being done in communities through um, Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations and members of the Digital Participation Charter um, really uh, have, have you know, an exemplar of how you should approach this, this particular issue. I mean, clearly, and um, uh, members of the committee will know that the government is committed to refreshing its digital strategy um, in probably in February this, this year. Um, and I think that, that issue, the whole issue of participation, will feature very heavily within that because securing the benefits of this connectivity, whether it be for, for homes or for businesses or for farmers, as we've heard today, is absolutely the heart of why we make these investments. I mean, is home internet access seen as a priority given that phones can do more and more? I, I think it's a, I, in, if I may, I think it's to a certain extent it's a slightly false distinction because the, the kind of um, uh, devices that are used are so variable and they're so, so varied. So, yes, a lot of people are um, accessing broadband now or accessing the internet via tablets and mobile devices, but you still need a uh, degree of fibre in the ground, a spine upon which that should develop. And as we go forward, that's actually the approach we're taking. We put a spine of fibre into the ground, that provides the backhaul that supports mobile, it'll enable us to prepare for 5G and all those technologies that are coming down the, the line. Okay. I mean, there, and we understand there are plans to uh, separate OpenReach from BT, which might increase competition. Would that have any impact on all of this? Would, would, will that help? Well, I, th I think the, the proposals from um, Ofcom in their strategic review of, of digital communications uh, had initial recommendations published in February, and they found that OpenReach um, still has an incentive to make decisions in the interests of BT rather than BT's competitors that can lead to competition problems. Mm. So, you know, plainly at a very high level, I think the finding was that this is bad for competition. It needs to be opened up. By opening it up, the tendency is that you have... Uh, more fierce competition and lower prices, and therefore access to uh, for those on lower incomes becomes better in a market that's working properly. So, you know, we welcome that aspect of the Ofcom regulation. It's at a very high level, but I think the the intention of of stimulating more uh, competition is is a good one. And uh, uh, you know, there, there there aren't that many mobile operators either, are there? And uh, you know, BT's just purchased another one of them. So. You know, we work with all the with all the operators, but we do, as a government, as Mr. Cook has said, want to to see sort of digital access, uh, not uh, not being ex uh, excluded to to those who are on lower incomes. And there's also another aspect, which is we uh, we we do also believe that there, there should be a, 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 an extension to tackle a, a, a palpable gender gap in ICT subjects and careers and the Gender Action Group has launched an action plan uh, just last month to focus our actions on young women in education and those already in or looking to return to the labour market. And I think you know, that's, that's something that we shouldn't lose sight of as well. I know it's perhaps not directly relevant to, to the kind of analysis of the budget today, but I, I hope all members would agree that's a worthwhile project. Thank you. Leave that there. Stuart's got a very quick question, I think, before we move on to transport, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, it, it's just in relation to uh, 5G. Um, the hardware standards for 5G are now established, but the software standards are not yet established. Um, the, the speed for 5G, they're thinking of one gigabit in cities, but 100 meg in rural areas. And they're talking about uh, the first tr practical trials deployments being in 12 to 18 months. I really just would seek to ask the government whether they might consider contributing some funds from the budget to ensure that one of the early trials of 5G is in a rural area so that the putative speeds that come from 5G can be tested in the real world 
and therefore the design of the contracts and sale of spectrum that UK uh, government will be responsible for properly reflects the needs that we have because 5G is still a bit of a moving target at the moment. And I think if we're in and helping understand it, and a yes could be the answer. I think, I, I think a cabinet <laughs> secretary, if I, if, if I could, a yes or no answer would be very helpful because we've got a lot of questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on. Thank you for, for the brevity of your answer. We're going to move on to transport, and John, John Finney's going to leave with a question on that, if you may, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning, cabinet secretary. Cabinet Secretary, the, the Scottish Government has a, a laudable vision of 10% of every day journeys to be made by bicycle by 2020. Mm -hmm. I'm told it currently sits at 1.5%, having been 1% for over a decade. Um, there's mixed news in the budget. Uh, the Cycling, Walking and Safer Streets budget goes up from 5.9 million this year to 7.4 million. Um, however, this is offset by a reduction in support for sustainable and active travel line budget. Um, and that will see the share of the transport budget fall from 1.8% to 1.6%, a fall of 6%. Um, at the same time, the motorways and trunk roads budget goes up by 146 million, an increase of 18%. Why is there no increase in the active travel budget? Um, well, we, we do a value active travel and we've in, invested pretty substantially, as, as Mr Finney knows, uh, over one billion a year in public and sustainable transport to encourage people onto public transport and active travel modes. So we are continuing the Future Transport Fund, which currently supports the development of priority cycling active travel infrastructure projects, working with local authorities. We are considering continuing with projects to accelerate the widespread adoption of low carbon vehicles. I did allude to that in, in my um, in my opening remarks, including the Charge Place Scotland network of electric vehicle charging points, also the purchase of low emission buses through the Green Bus Fund and the freight facilities for grants encouraging the transfer of freight. Um, compared to 2013-14, Convener, we have increased investment in active travel by over 80%. It was down at 21.35 million in 2013-14 to 39.2 million in each of the last three years. And uh, to answer the question directly, we plan to match this in 2017-18 in line with our program for government commitment to match record levels of funding for active travel for the duration of this parliament. I mean, I, I do understand that Mr Finney urges us to go further and that's absolutely understood and I understand where he's coming from in, in that regard. But I think kind of matching the the funding is a, 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 a solid sign of our continuing commitment and the implementation of our programme for government commitments. John, do you want to uh, follow uh, on? Uh, yes, if I may. I, I mean, that, that's all good, Cabinet Secretary. And the, the comments about increasing public transport use and the, the green buses and the electric travel points. But nonetheless, we still have the, the, the situation where for support for sustainable and actual travel is down. Where does that... How does that contribute... Mm to reaching this vision? Well, I'm not sure that's correct, but perhaps Mr Baxter, who's, who, who's working in this field, can, can just uh, confirm if I was correct, and I obviously I don't want to give the inform any, any incorrect information to the committee. Mr Baxter yeah, can perhaps the, opine on the that. The sustainable and active travel um, totality of it is made up a number of, across yes, a number absolutely. of budget lines. So whilst the sustainable and active travel level three figure is down, there are other components of the transport budget that counteract that. The overall commitment to maintain uh, 39.2 million uh, remains uh, within the 17-18 budget. It's just presentationally, and I'm more than happy to provide that detail to the committee uh, to, to demonstrate that. There is, there is a view, Cabinet Secretary, that in relation to uh, issues like climate change, obesity and other, uh, uh, there's a lot of people would commend, you would imagine, and I know perhaps the scribe was the usual suspects, stop climate chaos and spokes talking about a move to 10% of the transport budget going to active travel. We're way short of that. Is, is that part of any of the vision of the Scottish Government to move to an increasing percentage of the overall budget? Because, of course, that's clearly offset with a significant increase, an 18% increase in the motorways and trunk roads budget. Well, I, I mean, I think it's, it's fair just to, to, re, to remind uh, the committee that we are investing a billion 
over a billion a year in public and sustainable transport, um, we, we do make very substantial investment in our railways, and rightly so. Um, we're seeing more capital investment in the railways than for a very long time with the Borders Railway, with the improvements from Glasgow to Edinburgh, uh, with substantial, substantial improvements from Inverness and uh, Mr Finney's uh, home town to Glasgow and Edinburgh with the target of reaching two hours 45 minutes uh, in due course and matching the roads. In other words, you know, these investments are designed to attract people onto the train over time with an hourly service from Inverness being the, the ambition aimed for and very substantial investment in the Highland Main Line and the line from Inverness to um, a Aberdeen and just recently because Ms Ross's constituency is really at the forefront of our mind today, a, the Far North Line is the subject of a review group which I announced I think last Friday so that those working in the peatland restoration you know, will be able to be accommodated in the train to work <coughs> and be able to have a signal on the mobile phone to boot, she's pointing out. So, John, uh, so without you... being flippant, we are making a very substantial investment in these matters, as I think Mr Finney knows, and, uh, but I quite understand that you know, he, he will always put the case to do more, and, and we always want to work with him and his colleagues to study what more we can do. John, if you want a very brief follow-up. No, no, I mean, it's absolutely fair to record that these are commendable efforts with regard to the, the enhancement of the rail network, and that's appreciated. But it was specifically on cycling and walking, where there is some good news. In our part of the world, um, Cabinet Secretary, it's second in the, the, for cycle use at 6.1%. So there are been some positive initiatives. But specifically in cycling and walking, it's felt there's a lot more can be done. Well, fair, fair enough. We'll take that point away, convener. Thank you. Um, Richard, you want to come yeah, in on the act of travel? Can Mr Baxter confirm, and I'm looking at page 28, um, support for bus services actually went up from 50.7 50, 50 million to 54.2 million, and an increase of 6.9%. And can I remind, whilst I agree with my colleague in, in some areas, that the new M8, M74 upgrade uh, has cycle and walking routes extensively uh, added in um, I, I, I think your point is well made, Richard, and, 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 and maybe uh, if you're happy, Cabinet Secretary, I could, I could leave that one there, just because we have got a few questions to go through. Sorry, sorry Kevin, I mean, have I misunderstood something? I, th I think we, we've been here for an hour and a half allotted, and I have other commitments to, to do. Sorry, we, we, have, we have other... Uh, uh, we, we, we're over a short time. I, I, I mean, I, obviously, I want to be accommodate the committee. That's why 90 minutes was allocated, but... We you know we have been here, as I understand it, for, for the allocated time, and I have another engagement. Uh, well, I don't think we got a formal uh, notification of, of, of your timings, and I thought that the committee was going to go on. It, 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 uh, are you saying that you are unable to continue? Well, I to believe I have a, another engagement to attend, but my, my understanding was that the agreed allocated time was, was a full 90 minutes, which is 30 minutes more than the previous administration ministers used to devote to these committee meetings, so far as I recall, but uh, I could be wrong about that, but I had thought that we agreed 10 to, to 11.30, but, uh, you know, but well, I'm not involved in these discussions. My, perhaps the clerk could just confirm if that's the case. Well, I'm very happy for, for, for you to say the, the position. Yeah, can I just say that, you know, that was all indication given to your office. There was no indication you had a, a, you know, a further engagement after this, but... It's up to the convener. I, I haven't been working on the fact that you had to, to cut away. Well, you know, we've, we've obviously then been working uh, to disadvantage, but I have got other, in fact, a whole string of other engagements today, including well, maybe, maybe. a ministerial statement and uh, several meetings that uh, are very important that I cannot... Okay. Uh, well, like, so my, my understanding was that I was here for the full 90 minutes, convener, but not an extension of that. So I'm very happy, of course, to answer very quickly... Well, the, maybe, maybe we could writing. limit those to three questions, if I may, and, and, and I'd like to ask Rada to go first on ferries. Um, thank you. Um, there is an increase in the Clyde and Hebrides ferry budget, and I was wondering what that was about. But also in the Northern Isles ferry service, I understand there's a commitment to look at decreasing fares, but there's no increase in the budget corresponding to that. I think it was 11 point. Uh, Mr Baxter will answer that. Can I take the first point just in terms of support for ferry services, which actually covers the Clyde and Hebrides ferry service, Northern Isles and Gurk Danoon, in terms of the totality of that budget. In respect of the increase, there are four components to it. 
One is the uh, rebasing of the CHIFS 2 contract, and, and given when the, the, con the tender was prepared, that was based on uh, 2015 timetables. Because of movements between the timetable in 2015 and the current position, that, that effectively needs to be adjusted for in terms of the tender price. In terms of uh, service development, um, there is an uplift in related to the development of smart ticketing uh, for use on the CHIFS, um, CHIFS 2 contract, uh, which will be taken forward in conjunction with Transport Scotland. And in terms of the Northern Isles Ferry Services, there's an uplift for CPI, uh, just inflationary uplift in terms of the Northern Isles contract. And the last element, which was dealt with as a, an in-year pressure, relates to the uh, contribution towards the funding of the pensions deficit within the, the CHIFS um, uh, pension arrangements. So that's the, the components of the uplift on ferries. Okay, but there is no there is no money set aside for a reduction in fares for the Northern Isles? Not at this point, but discussions are ongoing uh, with regard to the options for that, because um, clearly a, a straight application of RET wouldn't be appropriate in terms of the Northern Isles, so that work's continuing. Okay, thank you. Okay, two, two very quick questions, and, and quick questions with quick answers. Stuart Stevenson on concessionary fares. Um, the concessionary fare budget is down by 9.5 million. Uh, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm uh, that this has no effect on concessionary card holders' ability to use the bus network? Uh, well, I think uh, Mr. Baxter has got the detail of that. I mean, I, I, I can say that the, there has been a substantial variance between the estimated cost in total. Uh, at the beginning of the year of the concessionary travel commitments and the outturn, uh, the outturn has very often been very substantially less than the estimate for very obvious reasons that it's, it's not known at the start of the year what the uptake and the usage of, of an open-ended scheme will be. So the budgeting of this is very difficult and the negotiations are very delicate and obviously <coughs> our job is to get the, the best result that we can. But perhaps Mr Baxter could elucidate on the process regarding that uh, discussion, which I think is ongoing with the Confederation of Passenger Transport, Mike. Yeah, that, that's correct. The, uh, the reimbursement rates are, are currently being negotiated for next year. Uh, the point the Cabinet Secretary makes is, is absolutely right in, in the sense that historically um, the budget line for concessionary travel has been underspent and the budget for the bus services operators grant, which was previously referred to, was overspent and the, and the two things balanced off. So there's been an adjustment to the budget to reflect the actual demand uh, uptake, which for the current year, the outturn is actually projected to be in the order of 195 million uh, for this year, uh, covering the uh, older, per older persons and, and uh, disabled and young people's elements of the scheme. Um, and uh, there's been an adjustment for that, re that regard. Um, there, there is reference in the programme for government a commitment to consult, and that will be done uh, early next year around uh, the future sustainability but of the scheme? Ju ju just very concisely, the budget provision leaves, short of the consultation, which is another matter, the entitlement for cardholders unchanged. For those that have them, yes, absolutely. That's fine. That's what I want. Okay, and the last question then uh, at this stage is Richard on, on, on Presswick Airport. It's in the government sector, there's other uh, items to do, I'll, I'll be brief. I welcome the um, increase in funding for other, ser other air services, um, up 2.8 million to support ad additional lifelines to Barra, Campbellton and Tyree, and route development and connectivity. Uh, in regard to Presswick Airport, I support and, and I feel that Presswick Airport is very underutilised. I know it does a lot of freight, but um, I, you know it's an excellent airport. I was there a couple of weeks ago collecting my daughter, and I think it's a, an airport that could be used. What other um, work are we doing to increase the use of Presswick Airport? Mike. Sorry, I just condense that because I'm, I'm mindful of the Cabinet Secretary, and I, I would like to try and uh, to acquiesce to, to his thing is to say that I think there was loan funding in the budget of 9.4 million that's correct. and, uh, and the, quest the question was well I, I think that's the question that we're looking for an answer for is that sufficient to allow the development of Presswick Airport along the lines of Rich that Richard is indicating? Uh, the degree of loan funding included within the budget is reflective of what's in Presswick's business plan 
Um, so that's that's a consequence of of them yeah, because of, their but because of that money you're actually developing. We're on the board. You're going to develop it. Try to develop it more. Yes. yes. A simple yes or no. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Press, Presswick Airport is extremely important to us, and that's why we are investing heavily in it and working extremely hard with the management uh, in order to develop it successfully over the years. It's not an easy thing, but Mr. Lyle and the committee members should be assured that it's an extremely important matter for us. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to thank you and your, your officials for coming today. We had no indication that your timetable was so, so tight. Uh, as an observation, in, in, in future years, an hour and a half to scrutinise the budget, which is effectively all we have between Christmas when the budget was laid and, and when the report has to be started to be looked at is incredibly tight and I certainly will be pushing the clerks to allow for more time and more time in the budget so that the committee can have a full chance to answer all the questions. But I would like to thank you for coming and wondered if you wanted to make a brief closing statement before you have to dash off. I, I enjoyed the meeting. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can I wish you and your officials a happy Christmas and thank you for attending to the committee. There will be a brief pause while I suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to re leave the room. Thank you. The third item on the agenda, sorry, I should like to reconvene the meeting. The third item on the agenda, uh, agenda is consideration of three negative instruments as detailed on the agenda. This is a package of instruments which in introduce a decriminalised parking regime within East Lothian Council area. Following previous consideration of decriminalised parking restrictions in the Highland Council area, the committee requested further information on the income and expenditure resulting from the implementation of such schemes in other local authority areas. This response can be found at Annex A of Paper 3. The committee would now consider the issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to these instruments to the Parliament. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments. I would invite comments from the members. Are there any comments from the members? Is the committee then agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to these instruments? Agreed. That is agreed. That therefore concludes the public part of today's meeting. I will now suspend the meeting to allow the committee to move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>